because philosophy doesn't have a good name, um, I thought I had to present something that was concrete, as in a deliverable. Uh, so a project that uh, would give you a sense of what I've been uh, doing recently and uh, of something that uh, might be in your hands uh, in the next uh, six months. So this is really basically a book uh, that I'm uh, uh, editing for the European Commission, uh, the uh, DG Connect. Um, but before telling you a little bit about this particular project and using it as an excuse to do a bit of philosophy under the carpet, um, three metaphors. You already had one, uh, give you the other two, and I'm sorry for those of you who will come to the presentation of the book because I will use them again. Uh, philosophy as, well actually the philosopher as the gardener. That's the where philosophy happens. Happens underground, you don't see it. It's dirty, we look at the roots, we like the flowers, but if you care about the flowers of the tree, you want to look at the roots carefully. That's where philosophy does its job. So if sometimes it's obscure and not very visible, it doesn't mean that it's not absolutely essential. That's the where. The when, philosopher as the dentist, we tend to leave philosophy at the last minute. We don't want to do philosophy, it's painful. But sooner or later, you have to go to the dentist. If you have a problem, sooner or later, a philosopher will be there for you. Uh, trust me. <laughs> and third, um, the how, the long jumper. Sometimes you have meetings with uh, politicians in Brussels and they do not immediately understand why they are funding your research because they want to go in their direction and you're actually walking in their direction. And you have to explain to them that if you want to jump really far, the best thing to do is to take a long run up. And that's what philosophy does. It walks exactly in the opposite direction of where you would expect the solution because only in that way you can jump far enough. Now that's the third metaphor. So go the where, the, the, uh, the, the when, and the how. Let's see if I can put these three metaphors around a more concrete, you can tell that it could have been really vague, a uh, more concrete uh, sort of uh, uh, deliverable. So the On Life Manifesto uh, is going to be a book. Uh, this um, subtitle is Being Human in a Hyper-Connected Era. Uh, basically in 2011, I was uh, approached uh, by uh, DG Connect, uh, the European Commission, um, to put together a research group that would um, uh, investigate the conceptual impact of ICTs on European citizens. They had, uh, and they have a lot of research done in many other corners, but in view of Horizon 2020, they also wanted to know uh, what philosophy could tell about uh, the impact of ICTs on uh, our life. And uh, in that sense, uh, they were very generous. Uh, they provided plenty of freedom and financial support to put together the group that we wanted with the time that we uh, could manage within a year, uh, 2012, to come up with a clear understanding of uh, what difference uh, ICT is making to our conceptual framework, to our ideas behind the policies, which are behind the laws and uh, the economic impact of our reality. So it was called On Life because very kindly, the uh, European Commission picked up this um, uh, neologism from my writing, uh, which is quite simple, is the view that uh, in most countries, in most corners of our life, dividing uh, our experience as on life and offline, it doesn't make any sense anymore. We live in this on life uh, world where you know, by driving a car, following your GPS, it becomes meaningless to ask whether you are online or offline. It's just the wrong sort of 90s sort of question that we do not uh, really ask anymore in many corners. So the on-life experience was the idea that in these uh, corners of Europe we live um, a seamless uh, uh, experience. And uh, it was called, uh, and that's the European Commission title, the on-life initiative concept re-engineering re exercise, because they also picked up another philosophical bit from uh, my writings, namely this uh, view that uh, if you uh, have a particular conceptual framework and technology is changing it, then what you need to do is to redesign that conceptual framework. So um, the remit was to uh, work on the impact of ICTs on the human condition, um, how they are modifying relationships to ourselves, how we understand uh, who we are to each other and with respect to the world. So of course you can tell that uh, it was a huge philosophical uh, area to cover. And the groups of researchers, uh, we explored 
explore the policy relevant consequence, consequences of such an impact. We were interested in understanding, well, given this uh, sort of set of ideas, how are they going to affect how we shape policies down the road? Here is the very quick version of what it means to have uh, some concept re-engineering. Basically, you have concepts that give uh, us the tools to provide the world we mean, to make sense of reality, and to interact with reality. Think of the concept of democracy. You don't have it, it's going to be really hard to be able to you know, make sense of some uh, social facts. When reality changes, and it does that too quickly or dramatically, you are kind of conceptually wrong-footed. You had a nice bag of tools to do all your conceptual work in terms of understanding and shaping your world. The world is changing. That conceptual tool is no longer adequate. So that is exactly what has happened with the fast, deep, widespread impact of ICTs. Therefore, conclusion, well, you have to redesign your conceptual tools. Uh, if it has a bit of a smell of a uh, Marxist uh, view, well, uh, you're not too far away. But is Marx, as you were, upside down? No. It's, the, uh, it's the sort of conceptual tools that are shaping the world, not vice versa. Uh, we are, after all, on this side of the channel. So um, we uh, concentrated on four particular uh, points, um, which I illustrate in the second half of these 10 minutes. The blurring of the distinction between uh, reality and, and virtuality. We heard already, uh, thanks to the previous two talks, quite a lot about this blurring uh, of different uh, contexts. The blurring of the distinction between human, machine, and nature. These are all fixed points that Western civilization and Western culture has taken for granted, as in, we don't even know there was a problem there. Hmm? The reversal from information scarcity to information abundance. That is well known to everybody in this group. And the shift from the primacy of entities to the primacy of interactions. And that has to perhaps uh, uh, a bit of an extra philosophy in it that will require one extra slide. So I'm going to illustrate these four points with four uh, elementary uh, sort of illustrations. And that is the end of the talk after that. So reality and virtuality, you know exactly what I'm talking about uh, when I show you this picture. Uh, by now, it's less than a 1,000 pounds uh, on Amazon. That is quite extraordinary, because what we know that what we're selling is no longer the stuff. It hasn't been the, uh, the case for a long while. I mean, especially if you're Italian, what you buy is Calvin Klein. You don't care about the real underwear. No, you buy you know, the particular uh, sort of uh, brand. And there's a reason. Because the top uh, 100 brands are worth 2.4 trillion in 2012. Those are names. There's 2.4 trillion value of no stuff, certainly. So that is, as we were, virtuali virtualizing the real. Uh, remember the Calvin Klein in the underwear. But you also have a movement of reification of the virtual. Global video game market is worth 65 uh, billion in 2011. And what is that, if not what we heard before, a, a movement in the other direction? These two currencies are, are mixing up. And if you are 15 years old, you should be confused. Hmm. Human, artificial, and natural. This is a, a beautiful example. Um, if you haven't uh, read about it, I mean, it was all over the place. But that's Catchy Hutchinson controlling a robot arm with her thoughts uh, through BrainGate, May 2012. Now, ask to an old philosopher, 17th century, whether there was any difference between the human and the artificial. And he would have said, of course, I mean, that's us, that's the machine. It's a Newtonian view. Today, the us and the machine is getting mixed up rather radically. And it doesn't mean, therefore, that it's a good thing or a bad thing. It means that we had to rethink that particular point on which we were no, nicely lying you know, in, with our conceptual weight to build our policies. Scarcity and abundance, this is one of the thousand pictures you've seen about this big data. And I'm not going <laughs> to sort of offend you to ex <laughs> by explaining what it means. Perhaps uh, just a, a quick reference to these uh, two pictures. And you only need the picture. You don't even know what they are actually saying in details. Because one, it goes, goes uh, up, how fast our computers are going. And the other one goes down, how cheap uh, they are becoming. The problem here wasn't just realizing the obvious, because that is there. but to realize that, uh, first of all, the limits uh, that we are encountering in terms of uh, uh, growth are sort of um, not easily overcameable, but they are setting up very wide, uh, uh, very wide context. Thermodynamics, that's what is going to be uh, intelligence, hours, and memory uh, space. The memory space um, is something that, for the purpose of this quick presentation, I would like to call your attention to. We're not producing enough memory space. Uh, as you know, we are producing way more data than 
but, it, but it's not uh, wrapping up, uh, almost there. Uh, we are just not producing enough uh, memory support for the data that we're producing. So something should never be recorded in the first place or should be erased. The policies behind the not recording or erasing of data are huge <coughs> for future generations. They are immense impact in terms of what we're saying, what we're not. And uh, the last point uh, from entities to interactions. I picked up this picture, which is maybe some of you actually went through the magic roundabout no, going to Oxford. If you haven't, uh, I, I haven't, so I uh, can't tell you. But imagine the following picture. Someone enters into this room and tells you, imagine roads and roundabouts. What comes first? And he's like, that's, that's, that's idiotic. Roads first, and then roundabouts. Obviously. But 25 centuries of metaphysics on this side of uh, the world have taken roundabouts coming first, and roads next. Or individual like us, the roundabouts, coming first. And our relations are something that happens once you're there. Is exactly the same thing as, as telling someone that first there's a roundabout and then you connect them with roads. Surely not. Surely the roundabouts emerge from the intersections of these roads. Surely we are like roundabouts emerging from these intersections. So that is another major shift in our metaphysical view that we are sort of just started uh, coping with. And these are roundabouts of relations and processes. Conclusion philosophy, therefore, the way I presented to you is more like conceptual design. Uh, it's about uh, creating, evaluating explanatory answers uh, for questions that are generally open to debate. Uh, honest disagreement, even in principle. That's why they're philosophical. Otherwise, you will be doing some empirical study of good kind or some logical mathematical analysis. If you cannot, if you can still disagree about it, that means that there is a philosophical question. It could be as silly as, should I wear my uh, hair long? Or as deep as, am I a roundabout? Investigation considers space of inquiry broadly defined as normative. It's an open space, so do not ask someone like me whether you should be in the philosophy department, because anyone can be a philosopher. It doesn't matter where you are, but what you're doing. And I suspect that a lot of people in this room are doing philosophy, despite their taste. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's it. I knew it. <laughs> don't, don't worry. It's the embarrassment that normally follows these kind of things. <laughs> you said one of the uh, objectives of GG Connect was working out how this, the policy implications, policy relevance of this. I mean, what, 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 what how far? Do, yes. Yeah. So once I've taken all these steps back, how do we jump forward? So the, um, after this uh, work um, will come together, which is happening as we speak, uh, the, um, that should affect not the policies themselves immediately, but rather how people are going to uh, organize uh, Horizon 2020, which then will affect the policies, which then will affect, for example, uh, funding um, uh, strategies. So I, as I said, it, it is a long sort of uh, walking back, but if you can start imagining affecting the minds of those who are going to take decisions about what sort of policies have to be in place so that Horizon 2020 uh, takes that particular shape, that's what's happening here. So in this particular case, for example, when it comes to um, the, uh, the divide, let me just pick up one uh, case, uh, the divide between the virtual and the real, um, we try to uh, show that uh, it is important to take into consideration a shift from uh, a conception of relationship with things as ownership, mine, yours, versus a conception of relationship with things as in usage. It doesn't matter, as long as I can use it 24-7, I don't have to own it. And uh, that, for example, starts explaining why uh, some people find perfectly fine uh, to uh, take pictures of uh, paintings in, uh, in a gallery, and they would not steal that photograph from the shop, despite the fact that you are not allowed to take pictures in that gallery. You see what I mean? So the, back to the usual analogy, you will never steal a DVD from the shop. That is so forgive me for this, Newtonian. Of course I wouldn't, but there's a big difference between stealing, not the DVD from the shop, and downloading a file on the web. So if I'm downloading it, I'm not taking it away from you. I'm just sharing it with someone else, from ownership to usage. If that is gonna affect the policies, well, we shall see. But at least they were well received as in terms of, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I, um, I was wondering if you could talk about the 
about the blurring lines between man machine man machine and nature. Um, and I was wondering if you see this as a rather evolutionary process, and where are we in this evolution? And especially when we think about concepts of singularity, which will be compared to the blurring lines now between man, machine, and nature, singularity being machine, nature merging into one, maybe this would be a revolution. So where are we in this, this process of going there, or are we? Yes, um, that, that opens up a, a, a kind of a singularity worms that I really don't want to look at, um, because that is highly science fiction. Uh, what we presented here is, and the work done in, in this context, is based on current technology and current understanding of where the technology could possibly go for the foreseeable future. Barring anything like a new Newton or a new you know, uh, Einstein coming up and telling us the world is completely different. Mm -hmm. If what we know is, no decently okay, there is no singularity coming at, at any point in the foreseeable future. Therefore, as I on 2020, for example, is important. At least we start putting millions of uh, euros in that particular corner, because they will go down the drain. Back to your point, it's much more interesting to look at all this and similar things in terms of um, a change in our self-understanding. And uh, I'm looking at Mark, I'm, I'm okay with time. so. so the, the point that is behind this is uh, Freud put together this, the following three revolutions very quickly. He said, I'm number three, but the previous two change up, where changes in science that made a difference in our self-understanding. Copernicus changed the, the view of the cosmos, and oops, you change your view about yourself, where you are, how important you are. Retrench, your centrality is not with respect to the universe, it's with respect to the biological game. You are no, the master of the biological game. Darwin comes in and says, sorry, that game is also lost. You have better retrench somewhere else because you know, you're not the no, king of the, the game. Retrenching was, okay, Descartes. Now, the clarity with which we have access to our minds. Freud comes in and says, well, sorry, that also has to go. So, um, no, the subconscious, etc. So these three revolutions show that <coughs> science made a big difference in how we understand the world and to ourselves. The fourth one, which is basically Turing, is to understand that we now live in an infosphere where we're sharing you know, the space that we have of information with artificial agents that are not intelligent like us, they're not more intelligent than us, but they're smarter than us. In other words, they can, you know, as we all know, they can do better than us, even if differently from us. You don't want to play chess with one of those things. And you don't want to play, you know, even, was it Caesar Stone, was BBC News recently? Uh, because they can do that better than you. And they can land a, an, an airplane better than you. And they can probably park uh, the car back then better than you, certainly better than my wife. It's not going on record, it's right? Uh, uh, so there are lots of things that uh, we are learning to share in that environment. That is much better view, therefore, in terms of Horizon 2020, how do you fund research of what kind, what sort of interactions, rather than any singularity, which is not going to happen. You can relax on that. I mean, I'm fine with agreeing with most of what you say, and partly because I've originally chosen as philosophy too, so this is the right way to think about things from the kind of conceptual engineering point of view. Right? So I like this. The implications, though, of some of these are really profound for our cognate discipline. So, I mean, I, I, the one that's kind of cropped up in the background a bit today has been e economics. People are talking about, uh, talk about non viable goods and the nature of information, and it seems to me that one of the real challenges is we don't have anything like enough thinking about what uh, the means and the production is what production looks like, what the value of these assets could be, should be, um, how open data works, you know, is just my particular kind of uh, thing at the moment. Um, how do we get, how do we encourage other disciplines who are deeply entrenched with their kind of current ontology of the way the world is to kind of think that actually, no, the game's changed now? You, you, you put your finger on the, the painful point. I mean, it's a conceptual deficit. We, we have a huge conceptual deficit here. As in, no, things are happening, we don't understand them because we don't even have the tools conceptually to put them in the right frame, right? Or if we have, we actually mis misunderstand what we're doing by thinking, oh, always done this way, therefore it must be, no, don't steal the DVD from, from the shop kind of idea. Which is mm -hmm. not. So how do we move across the barrier and how we push people? Well, sometimes you need um, motivations, you know, uh, gamification well, my, my, may or may not work. But unfortunately, um, I, in this sense, I'm being more, more of a 
Marxist philosopher than, than I would like to be, I think money will make a difference. That's where you can possibly shape uh, the sort of tendency to overcome barriers and, and tackle this conceptual deficit. Meaning that if Horizon 2020 decides to put some money where they are planning to put it, we will be helped uh, to fund research, for example, that we do here at the OII. That is you know, the, the reasonable, optimistic hope that one can have. But we are lagging more and more behind in terms of um, you know, what's happening, how we legislate, how we understand. And that is not going to be an easy task. I have the same point, but in reverse, isn't it rather, this, so this has been very interesting, but it's one view, one series of views, one series of concepts that, that you have, and you're suggesting that there should be policy and actions as a result of where you're going. To my mind, uh, this is interesting, but kind of there seems to be a lot more thinking needed before any long-term decisions or any long-term actions are taken. So yeah. isn't, isn't uh, I'm slightly no, you're nervous right. of creating policy on what looks like a good thought, but maybe we should have some more thoughts first. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the dust on the pole on the peak of the iceberg. But we had 10 minutes. Right? <laughs> so if we like, just uh, sort of you know, cleaning up the like, little dust, you, compl you, got, you got it right. I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is nothing but you know, the appetizer of a whole banquet. And we're missing a banquet here. And you know, that conceptual deficit I mentioned before, it's my invitation, including to the you know, new PhDs, students coming here saying, look, there's job to be done here. And is rewarding because of what you said. In other words, there's so much that needs to be done. And because it makes such a big difference. Not only is fantastically interesting, you know, philosophical, at least you, know, you can tell, but it also you know, means that you can be like Plato. He took the boats twice to go to Syracuse to make a difference. Of course, that was Italy. He couldn't you know, solve anything, not even at that time. But you can take the boat to Brussels <laughs> and make a difference. And if Plato can do it, surely, no, I can do it. In terms of, no, I'm not better than him, and therefore I can humble myself in terms of saying, well, that's the, that's the, the master sort of idea. You, we can combine this sort of uh, tackling the conceptual deficit, doing way more thinking that you pointed out, with some real impact in outside academia. That is the challenge that we are facing now. We fail to co uh, tackle that challenge, or we fail towards future generations. Uh, that has Simple as that. No good ideas, no new ideas, no solutions for the future. <laughs> We're going to be blamed. We won't be there, luckily, but we will be blamed, no, theoretically, for what we fail to achieve now, that we have seen that there is a need and we're not fulfilling it. So that's, that's my impression. But you're completely right. Way more work needs to be done. But your main argument is really, a, I think, is a call for reconceptualization, that uh, the concepts we use right across all the social sciences Best scenario, we need an upgrade. <laughs> Worst scenario, we need to reinvent the game. <laughs> You're saying to everyone who's working in the field, the economists, the lawyers, the sociologists, and so forth, you need to build a whole new conceptual framework. I mean, we may or may not want to share the same view here, but either this is a revolution, seriously, as in like, is making the world really different from anything we've seen before, and I share that view, which means philosophy better be on board and better be you know, an active player in this revolution, or we're joking. Uh, oh, it's more of the same, I'll write my papers, you write your books, and you know, it will be fun. And I share you now the view that this is making a huge impact on how we conceptualize ourselves, what's going to happen next year. If that's the case, we cannot afford to let philosophy do its own business in the average hour, one more metaphysical bit of non nonsense. I mean, that has never been the case. You pick up the top 15, 20 great philosophers in the history of this Western civilization, and they've always been involved with reality. Alexander was teaching, no, was taught by uh, Aristotle. And I, you know that this, no, Descartes went and got, they died because he was trying to teach the, the, the queen uh, there. So there's always been a combination of good philosophy, good policy, good impact. Either we rediscover that combination or we lost uh, Can we leave it to the politicians, though? 
No. <laughs> no. 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 That's what I, when he starts no. talking no. about Brussels, I start uh, yeah. Brussels. Yeah. No, but, <laughs> no let, let me spend... Uh, I was Brussels uh, too. Yeah, yeah. Even <laughs> if you don't put this on, on record, let me spend one, one single word uh, in favor. No, they invited us. So for okay. once, there was an opening that I hope we didn't screw up, uh, but there was an opening in terms of, you can read this in two ways, enlightened in Brussels or desperation. You run out of so many solutions, you ask even the philosophers because you don't know where to go. So, <laughs> right, so, my goodness, it's so desperate a situation that no, call the philosophers. Now, whichever way, uh, at least we're having a dialogue, and I think that yeah. is crucial. Um, we'll see how it goes. You're giving them a run for their long jump. Well, I hope right. so. No, <laughs> we shall see. Best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mark, sorry, I took um, way more than I was afforded. No problem. So, we, we, now, have a, we now have a quick coffee break. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.